Have you ever wondered why Earth doesn't have rings? Gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have them. But the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars don't. Two theories describe how ring systems potentially developed. The first one says that rings may have formed from leftovers that date from the time a certain planet was forming. Or, as the second one says, they could be the remains of a moon that was either destroyed in a collision or broken apart by the gravitational pull of its parent planet. Scientists still don't know why the gas giants have rings, but they think it could be because they formed in the outer solar system. Rocky planets formed in the inner area of our solar system, which is why they were more protected from potential impacts and collisions that might have formed rings around them. Or the reason is that the bigger planets have a larger volume, which allows a ring system to remain stable. Some scientists think our planet did have a ring system a long time ago. In its early stage, a Mars-sized object hit the Earth, and this probably resulted in a dense ring of debris. But its ring system pretty soon coalesced, and that's the way our moon was formed. More than 10 years ago, in 2011, astronomers found a huge water vapor cloud about 12 billion light years away from our planet. This cloud is the oldest source of water that we know of. It dates back to when the universe was only 1.6 billion years old. And now, it's 13.8 billion years old. This unusual cloud is also the biggest source of water that we know of. It holds 140 trillion times the amount of water that the Earth contains in all its oceans. <laughs> Enormous. The cool thing is, this vapor cloud is kind of feeding a black hole. It may contain enough gases, such as carbon monoxide, to help its black hole grow even six times bigger than it is now. We all know that Earth has one moon, but there are two more asteroids, 3753 Carinia and 2002 AA29, locked into co-orbital orbits with our planet. The first one doesn't really circle around the Earth, but has some sort of a synchronized orbit with the planet, which is why it looks like it's following the Earth in a stable orbit, while in reality, it has its own specific path around the Sun. The other one, 2002 AA29, follows a horseshoe orbit around our planet. Its specific path brings the asteroid closer to us every 95 years. You'd expect Neptune to be an extremely cold and dark place. After all, it's an ice giant 2.8 billion miles away from the sun. There's not too much sunlight there. So noon on Neptune is similar to twilight on our planet. But this ice giant appears to be creating its own heat. To be precise, 2.6 times more heat than it gets from the sun. This probably has to do with all the pressure near the planet's core. It builds and releases hydrogen, which keeps Neptune's center at a crazy temperature of 9,300 degrees Fahrenheit. But its atmosphere is still quite chilly. It ranges from about negative 240 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 330 degrees Fahrenheit. What shape do you think of when someone mentions storms? probably long ovals of hurricanes and conical tornadoes. But that's something we see on Earth. At Saturn's North Pole, a storm has been raging for at least the past 40 years, and it has a hexagonal shape. Such a weird shape probably has something to do with Saturn's turbulent gas, or maybe even with zonal jets that extend many miles down into a region of extremely high pressure. Have you ever wondered why planets don't twinkle while stars do? The thing is, if you were out there in space, you wouldn't see them twinkling at all. The reason we see stars twinkling is because of Earth's atmosphere. The pin-sized light coming from a star hits the atmosphere. The atmosphere then refracts it, which sends the light skittering off in a zigzag. That's what we perceive as the twinkle. Planets appear much bigger to us than just pinpoints. And yes, their light zigs and zags after hitting the atmosphere too. But those motions cancel each other out which is why we don't see twinkling, but only a steady glow. In some regions, you can expect big changes in temperature. For example, in Montana, where in a single day, temperatures went from negative 54 degrees Fahrenheit to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, sounds like a lot, but it's still nothing compared to Mercury, where temperatures tend to vary over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit in a single day. They start out at negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit at night, and eventually go up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the daytime. 
Picture a wardrobe you'd need to prepare for a single 24-hour visit to Mercury. Why doesn't the atmosphere of our home planet vanish and disappear into the vacuum of space? Even though we can't see them, the gas and vapor molecules that our atmosphere consists of all have mass. As such, all of these molecules feel the gravitational pull of the Earth, just like we do. They could escape, true, if they had enough energy. For instance, if our planet was closer to the Sun, the atmosphere would be hotter and its molecules could get away easier. But the Earth, fortunately, is just at the right distance from the Sun and has exactly enough mass to keep its atmosphere in the same place. When you think of volcanoes, you probably picture hot molten lava coming out of them. At least, that's how it works on Earth. But in space, volcanoes can spew methane, water, or even ammonia. Up there, a volcano can also spew specific materials that freeze as they erupt. Then they turn into frozen vapor and some sort of volcanic snow. It's a common thing on Jupiter's moons Europa and Io, also on Pluto, and Saturn's moon Titan. They're called cryovolcanoes, and Io has extremely active ones. Over there, you'd see hundreds of vents with plumes of frozen vapor that tend to extend about 250 miles. And NASA vehicles have even captured some erupting in real time. Bam! Planets, moons, asteroids, comets, and stars, they can all collide. And galaxies, too. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 2.5 million light years away from Andromeda, our closest galactic neighbor. Astronomers believe the Milky Way is on a collision course that will destroy both galaxies in the distant future. Or at least, galaxies as we know them. The two galaxies are going faster and faster toward each other at a rapid clip, 250,000 miles per hour. It will be chaotic, and many planets and stars won't survive the collision. Eventually, these two massive entities will merge and turn into a completely new, unrecognizable galaxy. But here's a small comfort. Scientists assume this is not scheduled to happen for another 4 billion years. In case you want to fuse two pieces of metal together, you already know the only way to do that is to apply heat so these pieces can reach their melting points. In space, you don't need heat to do such a thing, or basically, any action at all. We call it cold welding, and such a phenomenon happens when you slide the metal pieces over each other. In that case, they wear away their protective oxide layers. On Earth, these layers stop them from fusing, but in space, this type of protection disappears. That's why the electrons from one piece of metal just flow into the other piece. And, ta-da, they're one without any effort. Scientists used to believe the Earth was the only planet in our solar system with tectonic activity going on. Tectonically active means plates under the crust are moving. This process releases heat, which then deforms the Earth's surface and leads to its shrinking. But now, we know this happens on other planets, too. Mercury is also shrinking, and scientists found it out in 2016 when the MESSENGER spacecraft orbited the planet and sent back some important data. It revealed that there were cliff-like landforms known as fault scarps on Mercury's surface. Since these landforms are relatively small, they probably didn't form that long ago. That means Mercury is still contracting, even 4.5 billion years after our solar system was formed. Jupiter's great red spot is shrinking as well. It's a huge storm that rages on the planet's surface. It's reddish, a bit oval in shape, and more than 10,000 miles wide. Yep, that's big enough to swallow the Earth. And now, it's been slowly but surely shrinking for a couple of centuries. The Great Red Spot is just one of many high-pressure storms that occur across Jupiter, due to all those gases present there, which is something that classifies Jupiter as a gas giant. But just because it's shrinking doesn't mean the Great Red Spot is going to blow itself out anytime soon. It's even growing taller. Put on your shades because Mercury is a hot spot. From the surface of this planet, the sun looks three times bigger than it does from Earth, and the light is 11 times brighter. Mercury may spin slower than Earth, but it still knows how to have a good time. One day on this planet lasts a whopping 59 Earth days. But don't worry, a year on Mercury is only 88 Earth days long, so if you want to feel like a centenarian, just divide your age by naught. 0.25 or multiply it by 4. This way, you'll get your approximate Mercurian age. Easy peasy.
And let's not forget about Mercury's funky orbit. For every two orbits around the Sun, it spins twice. That means each hemisphere gets a full year of daylight followed by a long night. Time zones would be a mess on this planet. So we'll just stick to GMT. Ugh, did anyone forget to take out the trash? Why does it smell of rotten eggs in here? Uh, sorry, it's because we're on Venus now, and these stinky clouds don't smell like roses. Any planet's day is basically just how long it takes for it to do a full spin on its axis. Well, Venus takes its sweet time with this, way slower than Earth, in fact. So a day on Venus lasts a whopping 243 Earth days, or almost 6,000 hours. Now here's where things get a bit tricky. Because Venus's day is so long, we actually use Earth's day as standard for keeping time on the planet. That means there's only one time zone for the whole planet. Seems convenient, huh? Venus's year is about 225 days. So if you were celebrating New Year's Eve on Earth in the year 2000, that would have been Venus's year 3251. So to keep track of time of Venus, we can use the local year made up of 225 Earth days, but every three years or so, there's an extra short year made up of only 224 days. Not that confusing. We have leap years on Earth too, but it works a bit differently. We've made it to planet Earth. Woohoo! How many time zones do we have on this big blue ball? Give me a drum roll. 24. And did you know that we can actually mess with time a little bit? Yup, in about 80 countries, mostly in Europe and North America, we have something called daylight saving time. It's where we move our clocks forward an hour during the summer so we can soak up all that sweet, sweet sunshine. But beware, each country has its own rules about DST. So make sure you don't get caught snoozing when you're supposed to be working. And get this, some regions even have time zones that differ from UTC by half or quarter hour increments. Can you imagine that the moon is getting its own time zone? The European Space Agency announced on Monday that it's time for the moon to have its own synchronized time zone. With more and more countries and private companies planning missions to our lunar neighbor, it's important that we all speak the same language when it comes to timekeeping. Right now, each mission carries Earth's coordinated universal time with it, which is fine when there are only a few missions happening at once. But with dozens of moon missions planned over the next few years, things are going to get tricky. We need a system in place to make sure everyone's on the same page, or we'll end up with different spacecraft out of sync with each other, and nobody wants that kind of chaos in space. Precise timekeeping is super important for communication and navigation, so we need to figure out a way to make sure everyone's on the same page. The ESA hasn't figured out exactly what form this new lunar time zone will take, but they're working on it. Should there be a single organization responsible for keeping lunar time? Or should we let the moon set its own time? And what about more granular time zones based on the sun's position? These are all important questions that need to be answered. When it comes to a day on Mars, it's not too different from a day on Earth. We're talking 24 hours, 39 minutes, and 35 seconds. A Martian year is 1.8 Earth years, which means the Earth year 2000 happened in Martian year 1063. Almost forgot. The Martian year has 668 local days. Phew! We sorted out the Martian calendar, but Mars will need local time zones. Because of its elongated orbit, the difference between summer and winter hours will be significant. Daylight saving time will be a thing on Mars. A year on Jupiter lasts almost 12 Earth years. Yeah, that's like a lifetime in dog years. But don't worry, they've got 12 seasons to keep things interesting each almost as long as an Earth year, but a day on Jupiter only lasts 9 hours and 55 minutes. Also, since Jupiter doesn't have a solid surface, the clouds move at different speeds, so two free-floating atmospheric stations could experience different days. Hey, if we lived on Jupiter, we'd be in bad need of some cool app tracking all those things. Anyway, if we ever terraform Jupiter's region, most of the population will still live on Jupiter's moons because the atmosphere is just too wild. And get this, the moon's revolution periods are connected, so we can use the same day counting system for all of them. On Io, we can have two standard Jovian days in one Earth day. 
How do we break that down? Well, we could have a minute of 53 seconds and an hour of 103 minutes. Or we could just stick with Earth's minute and hour and have a day that's 21 hours and 13 minutes long. How old are you? I'm 200 days old and you? Sounds odd to you, Earth dweller, but uh, dudes on Saturn count their age in days. A year on Saturn is crazy long, like more than 29 Earth years. Kiddos would only get a fraction of a year, while the oldest folks might get a whopping three years. So to keep track of time on Saturn, we could divide up a Saturnian year into 29 or 30 seasons. Oh, and fun fact, Saturn doesn't even have a solid surface, just rotating clouds that spin at different speeds. But we could still set up some cool research stations or helium extraction balloons to float around up there. One Uranian year lasts a whopping 84 Earth years. So to make things easier, we'll stick to using Earth years for our calculations. And natural Uranian years can be used for special occasions, like reaching one Uranian year old. As Uranus doesn't have a solid surface, the rotation period is all over the place. Only science missions and helium mining companies are brave enough to venture into the atmosphere. And get this, each moon has its own day and date system. Pretty confusing. Most people won't ever celebrate one Neptunian year old. One year on Neptune is like that's way too long for us humans to stick around. But don't worry, we'll still bust out the confetti and party hats for special occasions like when it's been two whole years since the first spaceship hit up Neptune. As for the rest of the time, we'll just use Earth years for all our business needs. Pluto takes a whopping 240 Earth years to orbit the Sun, which is way too long to use as a year in our everyday lives. A day on Pluto is almost like a week on Earth. So, to keep track of time, we're going to divide that into six standard Plutonian days, three of light and three of dark. That means a standard day on Pluto will last slightly more than one Earth day. Now, because Pluto's axis is super tilted, using time zones would be pointless. So we'll just use one time zone for the whole system. Easy peasy. As for the standard Plutonian year, it'll be almost the same as the Earth year, about 343 days. But once in 10 years, we'll throw in an extra day just for kicks. That's all for now. See you on Pluto. Now, what would Earth look like if it was the only planet in the solar system? Or what would happen to our planet if the moon went missing? Or what if dinosaurs had never gone extinct? We've all heard the story, over 66 million years ago, a big asteroid hit Earth. Almost 75% of creatures that roamed the planet at the time were wiped out in mass extinction. Among them, dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Velociraptor, all gone. But because of that, we're all alive. According to science, the human race was developing more safely without these gigantic creatures hunting us. But what if that asteroid had crashed to the ground a few miles away from the place where it fell? What would the world be like today? Imagine walking down the street to your local supermarket and coming across a truck-sized T-Rex. Could that ever happen in this alternate universe we're talking about? Well, dinosaurs would have had to survive a lot more than an asteroid to be living nowadays. About 55 million years ago, the temperatures on the planet rose. The climate became 14 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is today. Rainforests flourished, and vegetation was abundant. In this scenario, herbivore dinosaurs would have likely thrived. But they would have started to look a bit different. Plants started growing during that time period were not very rich in nutrients. This means that dinosaurs would have probably shrunk in size, not having the necessary energy to grow all the way to their full size. Then, about 34 million years ago, South America and Antarctica split, which resulted in a cooler and drier climate. During this period, long-legged dinosaurs would have been the ones to survive. At that time, animals had to travel long distances to hunt, since seasons started to affect the availability of food and water. Compared to the mammals of that period, dinosaurs would have had significant advantages, like having more teeth or better eyesight. And speaking of mammals, some of them probably would have never evolved. That would have become dinosaurs' breakfast first. By the way, did you know that some dinosaurs live among us today? Think pigeons, or birds in general. They've all evolved from dinosaurs.
Now, I bet you've heard once or twice that we use 10% of our brains. If this was true, what would happen if you used 100% of our brain? Would you be able to compose a symphony? Would you become a tech genius and create a multi-million dollar company overnight? Let's start with the facts. We don't only use 10% of our brain. This notion became highly popularized by movies, but it's not very accurate. The truth is, the largest portion of your brain is active at all times. But not all parts are working simultaneously. The exact percentage varies from person to person. Now, neurologists say you wouldn't be using 100% of your brain's capacity at once. Your body simply wouldn't have enough energy for that, which means you'd be hungry all the time. Imagine the number of calories you'd need to consume for that to work. You would also be limited by your body's basic needs, breathing, digesting food, and circulating blood. So if you did use all of the capacity of your brain, you'd be tired all the time. It'd be worse than running a marathon without any preparation. The brain would need all the blood you'd have, which would mean less oxygen for your lungs. Different organs would begin to shut down one by one. In a nutshell, it'd be terrible for your health. By the way, some researchers have estimated that more than 60% of the brain is composed of something that is called neural dark matter. In other words, this dark matter consists of neurons that have no apparent purpose or simply don't respond to common stimuli. Marathons are some of the greatest feats of strength and endurance in the world. But what would happen to your body if you decided to run a marathon without any training? The statistics are overwhelming. Nearly 50% of participants drop out of the race before crossing the finish line. A regular marathon is 26 miles long. And if you're not used to physical activity, it's a great challenge. You'd probably be able to run the first mile without any serious problems, but breathing loudly and heavily through your mouth. By the third mile, your body temperature would skyrocket, and you'd feel as if you have a mild fever. You'd most likely give up here, but if you decided to keep going, you'd have to trick your mind and body into running another 23 miles. By the 20th mile, you'd hit what is known as the wall. Your body would have burned all your reserves of glucose, and you'd get extremely tired. Even experienced runners often go through this stage. By the end of the marathon, you'd be promising yourself to never do this again. You'd leave the race with at least a few cramps and many food cravings. Now picture this, it's a clear, beautiful night. There are no clouds and you can see two of the brightest planets in Earth's sky blinking up there. Those are Mars and Venus. Now, have you ever imagined what would happen if Earth was the only planet in the solar system? If the other planets never existed, things would be really different for our Earth. The planets in the solar system work together, keeping one another in certain place with their gravitational pull. Now, if Mercury or Venus ceased to exist, Earth would drift closer to the Sun. Our atmospheric temperature would become similar to that on the surface of Mercury. 800 degrees Fahrenheit. This would make life on Earth impossible, but if Jupiter or Saturn disappeared, Earth would most likely drift further away from the Sun, and its temperature would drop to below negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If life managed to survive in such circumstances, it would probably be aquatic. The position of Earth in the solar system not only affects all kinds of life forms, but it also dictates seasons, the length of days, and how long one year lasts. Now, when we say no other planets, we mean no moons either. So, what would happen if one fine day, the moon just disappeared? That would have catastrophic consequences. The moon has the largest influence on Earth's tides. In a moonless universe, tides would shrink by about 75%. This would greatly affect crabs, mussels, and sea snails that live in tidal zones. This would consequently disrupt the diet of larger animals. Eventually, it would affect entire coastal ecosystems. Earth's weather would change. Tides and tidal currents help mix cold Arctic water with warmer water from the tropics, stabilizing the climate worldwide. Weather forecasting would become almost impossible, and the average difference between the hottest and coldest places on Earth would become extreme. 
the absence of the moon would also influence Earth's tilt. Right now, Earth tilts on its axis at 23.5 degrees, mostly due to the moon's gravity. With no moon around, Earth's axis would wobble between 10 to 45 degrees. Scientists believe that even a slight difference in Earth tilt can cause huge changes, such as an ice age. Other than this, a moonless sky would upend the lives of many nocturnal animals. Moths have evolved to navigate using the light of the moon and stars. Newborn baby turtles use the moon's light to find their way to the ocean. Different animals rely on both darkness and a small amount of moonlight to hunt effectively. Now how about we travel far back in time and imagine what would happen if you lived in ancient Egypt. This civilization lasted for over 3,000 years. Ancient Egyptians were responsible for building some of the world's most recognizable symbols, the Great Pyramids at Giza. If you'd lived in ancient Egypt, you'd have witnessed a time of enormous scientific and mathematical breakthroughs. Ancient Egyptians organized themselves in strict social structures, so you'd probably have to fit into one of them. You'd have either been born a laborer, a farmer, or a specialist, which was either a soldier, a sailor, or a teacher, or you'd have been part of the Egyptian elite. If you had been a farmer, you'd probably live in a house made of mud bricks. You'd have had a stone oven and kept your food stored in a pit in the ground. You'd have spent your days tending to crop fields by the Nile River, or taking care of cattle and ducks. On tax days, you'd have packed up some of your harvest and brought it to the temple as payment for the usage of land. If you'd been a member of the elite, you'd have spent most of your days in banquets. You would have adorned yourself in gold and semi-precious stones, displaying all your wealth. If you had lived in ancient Egypt, maybe you would have been one of those who invented tables. Yep, before the Egyptians, there was no such thing as a table. This invention appeared as a way to keep food off the ground.